Welcome to this episode of Economics in Quarantine. We are here with a very, very special guest, Mr. Gordon Chang. Gordon Chang is a lawyer. He is an expert on China. He has a lot of background on China. He has lived in China. He has worked in China. And he has a bachelor's and a law degree from Cornell University. Very good pedigree. In this interview, we are going to be talking about China. We're going to be talking about the coronavirus in China. We're going to be talking about whether China deliberately exported this coronavirus. We're going to be talking about the effect of China on the scientific community. Has China polluted and corrupted the practice of science, such as bodies like the World Health Organization and even individual scientists? And we're going to be talking about China's colonization of sub-Saharan Africa and how we can remove ourselves from the political grasp of China. So, Mr. Chang, it's a pleasure for you to be on this show. As I was mentioning to you before, I've been watching you and your interviews on Tucker Carlson. I've been watching some of your interviews uh, aside from that as well. Uh, and you are not merely an armchair academic. As I mentioned, you have on-the-ground experience in China. You've worked for two law firms in China for a number of years in mainland China and in Hong Kong. Your father is Chinese. And yet many would classify you as a China hawk. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background and the evolution of your views concerning China. Oh, that's an that's a involved question. Um, I, I think that it, uh, my views on China evolved when my wife and I moved there. We moved there in August 1996, which was a really good time for China. Everything was moving in the right direction. And I can remember Lydia getting on the phone and saying, Mom, China's not communist anymore. And I agreed with her, you know. Um, but as we lived there and as we worked there, traveled around the country, we got to see a different perspective. And I can remember my clients buzzing in to Shanghai from New York or wherever. And they would stay at the Grand Hyatt, which is one of the most impressive hotels in the world. And they would tell me, China's not communist anymore. Um, and so I, I sort of, you know, that I, I sort of thought about this and, and um, I decided that uh, I wanted to write a book about it, which is what I did. Um, just basically drawing upon working there as a practitioner, um, having just traveled around the country on vacation and the rest of it, and just the experiences of friends and family. And that book is The Coming Collapse of China, which I'll that, link below, yeah. That, yeah, that book was The Coming Collapse of China. Um, and that book came out in the middle of 2001. And um, I've got to say it that, um, you know, in the book, I said the Communist Party would fail in 10 years. So I'm out of time. Um, but basically, I didn't foresee the 2008 downturn, which I think strengthened the party quite a lot, especially in relation to other countries. But in any event, um, there's a fragility in China. Uh, it's not as strong as it appears. And right now, of course, there is, uh, we're seeing a different side of China, one which is certainly um, less, less attractive, but also one which doesn't look quite as strong. So let's turn to China a little bit and let's talk a little bit about China and the institutions that have led to the current situation that we're in with COVID-19. As we know, and despite the warnings of certain people, the virus did originate in China. It is, in fact, a Chinese origin virus. Let's turn to the coronavirus. It has, as a Canadian, I'm very ashamed to say, a very unfortunate Canadian angle. The now disgraced Dr. Bruce Aylward, a Canadian physician who led the World Health Organization's team investigating COVID-19 in China. Dr. Aylward's motives, as you know now, were not purely scientific. He was on Hong Kong TV avoiding embarrassing questions about Taiwan. Taiwan, as my viewers and my listeners may know, is an enemy of China. And this is a part of a broader problem. Dr. Charles Lieber, a Harvard chemistry professor, was arrested recently for secretly aiding in China's Thousand Talents program or Thousand Talents plan, which from what I understand is essentially just intellectual property theft by another name. More remarkably, recently, Nature ran an editorial, I believe it was on April the 10th, which claimed that any attempt to link COVID-19 to China, to its geographic origin, is racist or prejudiced. To what extent has the Chinese Communist Party and its affiliates in the United States and in Canada corrupted the practice of science during this crisis? 
Well, I think that we have we've certainly seen that. There, there are many troubling questions about the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is that P4 biosafety lab 20 miles south of the wet market that was originally blamed for this outbreak. You know, Beijing, just as a general matter, has tried to penetrate other societies from the top to the bottom. And that means they have gone after academia um, because they believe that academia is influential in democratic societies. And of course, they're the source of a lot of intellectual property. So, um, you know, we've seen with the introduction of Confucius Institutes, which are these um, units essentially of China's propaganda arm, um, Confucius classrooms in secondary schools, um, there's been a real attempt to buy off um, the elite of academia around the world. And they've been very successful because, as you pointed out, um, we have seen statements and actions from of academics which are extremely troubling. Um, and not only just the ones at the World Health Organization, but others as well. So these uh, institutes, these Confucius Institutes, do they merely propagandize or do they also spy? That's a great question. Um, they, um, at one time, were about 110 of these institutes in America, and they were all around the world as well. And I think that you get a different answer for um, each of these institutes. You know, some of them are, are just, you know, language instruction. They, they do propagate um, China's notions of um, territorial, of, of Ch China's uh, Taiwan, um, the Tibet, and all the rest of this. But really what the effect here is, because universities believe that they need to have a good relationship with China, I think they tend to self-censor. And we have seen this at a number of institutions, and I focus on, on the ones in America, but they tend to self-censor. Um, and they do that for a reason that they believe that they need to keep the flow of Chinese students, um, and they want to keep Confucius Institutes. There are a lot of different um, motivations for this. But what they have done is they have um, warped academic freedom. So for instance, a lot of these institutions will not host, for instance, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, and they will not talk about sensitive issues regarding Taiwan. Um, China believes that Taiwan is a part of the People's Republic. People in Taiwan, by and large, don't think that. Um, um, people in Taiwan, by and large, don't think they're Chinese as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of issues here, but if you were to try to talk and have a full discussion of Taiwan on many American college campuses, it would be very difficult because you would have um, Chinese diplomats, you'd have Chinese students um, attempting to shut off those discussions. And that has really been a problem at a number of institutions, one which is very close to Canada, which is the University of Rochester. Um, but, you know, essentially we're seeing um, the narrowing of academic discussion, uh, at least on American campuses, because of um, China's infiltration. And just one other thing, it, it's not just Confucius Institutes and, and the formal outposts of China on these campuses. Also, we have Ministry of State Security, Chinese Ministry of State Security, as well as Chinese diplomats um, intervening, trying to control Chinese students um, in these campuses. Uh, organizing them for demonstrations, in other words, trying to change the political narrative in the United States, um, intimidating academics. Um, this has been a problem going back at least a couple decades. Um, so you add all this together, and it just seems to me to say that uh, Chinese uh, influence um, on these campuses is malign. Uh, and what we have to do is um, remove um, the communist uh, units of inf infiltration, which is really what they are. And we need to get Chinese diplomats and security agents, you know, not interfering in, for instance, um, American political life and American campuses. Yeah, in Canada, we had this problem in our campuses, too. At the University of Toronto, there was a pro-Uyghur and I believe a pro-Tibet protest that was recently subverted by a, a bunch of Chinese operatives in the city of Toronto. Uh, I'd like to backtrack for a minute, though. I think all countries, to some extent, use soft power and hard power in combinations. Why is China particularly pernicious? And why should we particularly care about China? It is a big economy, but why should we care about China's influence in particular? 
th there's a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that China is moving toward a totalitarianism. Um, you know, after, you know, it, it started out as a totalitarian society under Mao Zedong, um, after his successor, Deng Xiaoping grabbed power, there was a little bit of loosening of um, controls. And China was moving towards a more reasonable political system, one which was a little bit more open and certainly a more open economy. Um, under the current leader, Xi Jinping, it's moved in opposite direction. More state control of the economy, more state control of society, the imposition of social controls, which are starting to remind us of totalitarianism. So this is a China moving in the wrong direction. Is a China becoming much more belligerent, engaging in provocations, um, sometimes using force, trying to close off the global commons. But ultimately, there is one thing that people don't talk about, and that is Xi Jinping generally harbors the notion that there is only one legitimate society in the world, and that's China's, and that he's the only legitimate ruler in the world. What he's been doing is he's been, and I know it sounds ludicrous um, and audacious, but this is what he's been talking about. What he's been talking about are, are the themes that um, dominated uh, China's imperial era, 2000 years of history, where Chinese emperors believed that they had the mandate of heaven over something they called Tianxia, or all under heaven, that, they, that basically everybody else in the world had to acknowledge Chinese uh, rule. Now, um, this, of course, is a bygone era, but Xi Jinping has been recycling these themes in what he's been talking about. And indeed, just to give you an example, um, he had his foreign minister, Wang Yi, write an article in Study Times in 2017. Study Times is the influential publication, which is uh, the Central Party School. In other words, a, a major, um, it, it, is, it is a center of, of ideological thinking. And in this article uh, in Study Times, Wang Yi wrote that uh, Xi Jinping thought on diplomacy. And in Communist Party lingo, a thought is an important ideological body of work. Wang Yi wrote that Xi Jinping thought made innovations on and transcended 300 years of Western international relations thinking. So if you take 2017, you subtract 300, you almost get to 1648, which is the Treaty of Westphalia which establishes the current international system of which recognize competing sovereign states, which cooperate, work with each other, fight each other, but we recognized sovereignties, divided sovereignty. Well, when Wang Yi wrote that Xi Jinping was transcending 300 years of Western international relations thinking, he was saying, look, we're throwing Westphalia over the side. We want to go back to this notion of Tianxia. That's extremely dangerous, which means that he looks at Canada, he looks at my country, the United States, and says, oh, you just are subjects to a greater Chinese court. That's why this is dangerous. That, I am speechless. I am speechless. I did not know this. This form of sovereignty is a form of sovereignty that I thought was antiquated at this point in, in history. Um, so, I mean, with that in mind, I'd actually like to skip to one question I had about China's drastic colonization of impoverished sub-Saharan sub African countries. Many of these countries are, have people which majority of people live on two, three dollars a day at most. How is China operating colonization in practice in sub-Saharan Africa? And uh, how is that affecting the continent and their ability to fight poverty? Well, you know, people say, uh, and I think this is a good generalization, that when Western countries give aid, what they try to do is make um, aid recipients independent. Um, you know, capacity building is the term that we use. In other words, um, countries should build their own capacity to govern themselves effectively. Well, when China comes in and gives aid, it tries to make countries dependent. And we've seen this with this Belt and Road Initiative, which was announced in 2013 to try to tie the world to China. Uh, and what it's done is by corrupting uh, local elites, um, by making loans which can't be repaid, it's, it's really trying to um, further what's known as debt trap diplomacy. And we've seen this, for instance, um, perhaps the most graphically in Sri Lanka with um, uh, the port of Hanbantota, 
which is now basically owned by China after they, Sri Lanka couldn't repay debt. And we're going to see this elsewhere, especially now some of these loans in Africa are in a point where uh, countries can't repay. So um, what China's basically done is it's tried to sort of extract resources, um, and it's also tried to flood these countries with Chinese workers, Chinese individuals, um, and as well take over local manufacturing. So this has really been a problem for many African societies. Ultimately, though, I worry a lot about China. I don't worry about China taking over Africa. And the reason is um, deeply embedded in uh, the ideology that the Communist Party promotes. It's racist. It mm -hmm. believes that um, Chinese are superior to the rest of humankind. Matter of fact, they don't even think we're part of humankind. They, be they don't believe that the Chinese evolved from Lucy, the so-called so common ancestor in Africa. They believe in Peking man, um, a separate race of humanoids that just happen to be Chinese. Um, so they have a very different feeling. And also we can see this in the recent headlines coming out of um, southern part of China where Africans are um, not allowed into McDonald's. Um, they're not allowed to anywhere um, because they're African and that people believe that they've got uh, COVID-19. Um, this, this headline comes up every three or four years um, where we see just overtly racist attitudes on the part of Chinese, which is really the result of indoctrination. And this indoctrination, Cornelius, it comes from the top. A couple of years ago in the Chinese uh, Spring Gala, which is that show, uh, regular, which is probably the most regularly watched show on the planet. Every year you get 900 million people watching this. Well, they had a skit called Let's Celebrate Together, which was supposedly in Kenya, which depicted Africans as basically subhumans. Oh my. This is not something that is going to win hearts and minds in Africa. So long term, yes, I worry about China, but I don't worry too much because Chinese racist ideology will really poison relations that countries have there with Beijing. I was gonna say, you know, this is surprising to me. This is probably, this is something I certainly didn't know about. I didn't know about the extent of this Han nationalism that you're talking about. And I didn't know that in some respects, and I hate to draw this comparison, but it kind of resembles the fascist nationalism of the 1930s in some ways, right? What you're saying is essentially they, they believe in the superiority of their race and they want to subjugate all other peoples to their whim. Yeah, and we're seeing this, of course, in what the Chinese call Xinjiang, which they believe is the northwest part of their country, which the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs there call East Turkestan. Um, and we've got people, um, maybe a million, maybe three million, um, in concentration camps. Um, and this is an attempt to eliminate Uyghur culture, um, to eliminate the faith of Islam. Um, it is ugly. It is, it's, it's actually worse than what the Third Reich did prior to the mass exterminations of the early 1940s. So uh, uh, as the Dalai Lama calls it, this is cultural genocide. It's not just the Uyghurs, of course, it's Tibetans. They're going after everybody who is considered a minority. And this is the result of um, decades of indoctrination. So we've got to understand what's going on here. Um, because if you're not Chinese, and if China ruled the world, this would be a really unpleasant place to exist. Yeah, it's fair. I'd like to bring the discussion now back to COVID-19. And I'd like to talk specifically about China's takeover of global institutions like the World Health Organization. President Trump, as you know, recently threatened to withdraw U.S. funding for the WHO. In response, WHO chief Dr. Tedros uttered an ominous warning. He said, if you don't want many more body bags, then you refrain from politicizing the virus. Yet it is the WHO who seems to be politicizing the virus. For example, the WHO refused to share data with Taiwan about the virus, which is a geopolitical enemy of China, Taiwan is, and even refuses to acknowledge Taiwan's existence as an independent nation. We know that China lobbied heavily for Dr. Tedros's appointment as WHO Director General. Dr. Tedros has some communist leanings, which could explain his kowtowing to the CCP. Are there any other sinister connections between China and the WHO that we should know about? Oh, and I have two hours to talk about this, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> talk about it as much as you like. Okay. Uh, there's a couple things here that I think that yeah. um, need airing. Um, the WHO um, 
is involved in a lot of sins when it comes to the coronavirus, but the primary one involves this whole issue of human to human transmission. China formally acknowledged human to human transmission on January 20, but doctors in Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak, knew by the second week of December at the latest that uh, human to human transmission were occurring, uh, which means Beijing knew about it a couple of days later. But in that period, some second, third week of December, all the way to January 20, Beijing um, was quiet about this. Now, just being quiet would have been grossly irresponsible, but it was worse than that, because during this period, Beijing actually tried to convince the world that there was no possibility of human to human transmission. And the reason we know this is because the WHO, in Dr. Tedros's infamous January 14 tweet, said, well, based on information from China, um, there's no clear evidence of human to human transmission. This is important because obviously health authorities around the world weren't going to take precautions that they might otherwise would have, or well, certainly would have, if they knew this was transmissible in this fashion. But it gets worse because China lobbied very hard against travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China. And that's how this disease spread from China. It was travelers from China bringing it to elsewhere. That's the reason why we have a global pandemic. Well, the WHO in its January 10th statement fully backed China in trying to oppose these travel restrictions um, and quarantines. So WHO and China were working together on two things, no human to human transmission and keep your borders open. So that's how this became, this should, this should have been sort of like a local outbreak in Wuhan in the center of China. That's why it became not just a pandemic, but a global pandemic. And a couple of other things, if that weren't enough. China was issuing statistics showing low deaths and low infections. And we can say, yeah, maybe they were embarrassed, but this had an effect. We know this because Dr. Burks, Deborah Burks, the White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator, a couple of Tuesdays ago said, look, we looked at the data from China. We thought, oh, okay, this is like SARS, which was a 2002-2003 epidemic, which wasn't very transmissible. It wasn't contagious um, to any great degree. And so she said, look, we did not take precautions. It was only when um, the White House saw what was happening in Italy and Spain that they said, oh my God, this is really dangerous. And the WHO, by the way, Dr. Allward, that you, you mentioned, actually publicly said, look, we have no reason to doubt the uh, accuracy of China's numbers. So you put all this together, Cornelius. Let's take a look at China for the moment. If you're Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, and you see the coronavirus has devastated your country, if you want to get even, you would do exactly what he in fact did. In other words, Xi Jinping, looking at his actions, there's only one explanation that fits the facts, that he deliberately wanted to spread this virus so that other countries would have um, the pain and suffering that China had. And to go back to your question, WHO, WHO helped him at critical points along the way in spreading the virus. As I said, I don't know what's in Xi Jinping's mind, but when you look at what he did, there are really very troubling implications that this was not just a leakage of disease from China, this was a deliberate spread. That's not to say that this was a bioweapon. I don't think it was a bioweapon, but Xi Jinping, having seen what happened, decided he was going to spread the misery. So uh, these actions seem to fit the motive that you are describing. But I do have one question about it. Why would China want to willingly hurt its trade partners? Doesn't that seem a bit self-defeating? It does seem a little bit self-defeating. Uh, and obviously, China's going to pay because um, its factories right now don't have export orders. They don't have export orders because their two largest export markets, the United States and the European Union, are flat on their backs. I mean, we're just not buying stuff. But um, the reason why he would do this is because if you're Xi Jinping and you believe that you should be ruling the world and you're the only country that's sick, well, that would be fatal to this notion of Chinese invincibility and infallibility. So I think what he decided to do was, okay, we've got it bad. 
we're giving it to everybody else. You know, I'd like to think that he didn't do this. I'd like to think that he's not a criminal. Um, but on the other hand, I don't know how else to explain someone who deliberately tried to mislead the world on, on contagiousness and deliberately tried to get the world to accept people who were carrying disease. So call it reckless, um, call it intentional, but this is the first time in history that one country has attacked all other countries. If what you're saying is true, there should at the very least be a criminal investigation into this. How would that proceed though? I mean, China's a very powerful country. I don't think the United States would be willing to take the lead on that, but I, I can only see the United States as the only powerful option to be able to do that at this stage. How would that well, proceed? Yeah, I think it would be hard. I think what would happen would be, um, it would be, I think that Xi Jinping committed a crime against humanity. I mean, we can talk about the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs, that's a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. But this is another crime against all of humanity. And the question is, what do we do? Um, it, if Xi Jinping leaves China, um, then you can grab him. And then you can haul him before, you can haul him before the International Court of Justice. Um, or my favorite solutions, you just send him down to Guantanamo. Forget the procedures. Um, or the other thing that I like is sending him for the rest of his life to Florence, Colorado. That's the supermax. Oh, the supermax prison. Yeah. Can we, I mean, can he, we, sorry, I was just going to ask, can we also confiscate CCP property in other countries? Like, I don't know if there's any property that's uh, affiliated with Chinese Communist Party members that's in Canada. I'm sure there is, but can we confiscate that? Uh, yes, you can. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, China holds more than a tr trillion dollars of U.S. Treasury obligations. Um, I don't think the U.S. should do this on its own because what China would do would be to say this is a repudiation of debt. Um, they would bash the United States and say we shouldn't be at the center of the global financial system. So I think that we should do this with um, the issuers of other major currencies. Other major currencies, Canadian dollar, British pound, the euro, Swiss franc, Japanese yen. If we all did it together and all confiscated Chinese assets, yeah then we've got the makings of a solution. Now, Cornelius, we will never make ourselves whole. We have lost too many people. You can't, you know, you can't compensate for the deaths. You can, even if you were to put the deaths aside, we couldn't, China does not have enough assets to make the world whole on economic losses. But the reason why we've got to do something, and it's absolutely essential, is not because we ever think we're going to pay off everybody. No, we're not. But we need to deter the Chinese communist regime from thinking that they can do this again. This is not going to be the last disease that China generates. And if we don't impose costs on China, they'll just go ahead and do what they've did the next time. And maybe the next time it's more contagious, more deadly. We, we don't know. But this is an unacceptable situation. China must be deterred. And the only way that I can think of deterring the regime imposing costs um, of the type that I talked about. Chinese I mean, leaders, when they're found outside of China, go to jail, their assets get confiscated, the assets of the country get confiscated, countries take their factories out of China. We just leave China and hope that the regime fails. I like a lot of what you're saying, but it seems like a tall order to be quite honest with you. Now, many of my listeners might be surprised to know that in addition to uh, allegedly exporting viruses, China also exports the precursor chemicals to make methamphetamine and fentanyl, two drugs which have been responsible for the opioid crisis in both the United States and Canada, 60,000 deaths from opioids in the United States alone just last year. In addition, China ex engages in intellectual property theft and currency devaluation. And as you recently said, the, the Chinese Communist Party exported the virus purposely. And some people even say that was a strategic move to nullify the US-China trade agreement. You have often written that countries like the United States and Canada must decouple their trade from China. At present, this seems like an impossible task, quite frankly. There are no other countries, to my knowledge, with the manufacturing base, infrastructure, and population size to make this a winning proposition. I realize the Trump administration has a few people like Peter Navarro, who I believe you know, who seek to break free from the grasp of China 
what concrete steps would you suggest so that the United States and actually a small and less powerful country like Canada, what concrete steps can these countries do to regain their manufacturing independence? There's a lot there to unpack. Um, first of all, just on your general point about what is feasible, I realize that what I've talked about in terms of costs in the, in the perspective of today, not feasible. But if you were, if think about where we were about China, let's say five weeks ago, um, you've seen the national and the global conversations and narratives change from China just dramatically. And you know, the question is, where are we going to be five weeks from now when people start to understand, holy crap, these guys actually did deliberately intend to spread the coronavirus. Um, so just to give you an example of, of the way the landscape is changing, you mentioned Peter Navarro. Navarro has not been a big fan of the Chinese Communist Party for quite some time. But there's also a guy um, called Larry Kudlow. Um, who is, uh, all, you know, President Trump's chief economic advisor. And Kudlow has been, you know, let's get along with China type crowd. Um, Kudlow on Friday suggested, and, and I was just shocked, but Kudlow suggested, look, the federal government should pay 100% of the cost of getting American factories and facilities out of China. I mean, that is stunning. Now, I don't know if that's going to go forward or not, but nonetheless, for Kudlow to say that, Kudlow, who was very much pro-engagement, um, you know, Kudlow from Larry from Wall Street, I mean, I, I, I don't know what to say. So um, conversation's changing. Now, there's a couple things going on here, Cornelius, which I think long-term. First of all, the world is deglobalizing. Um, Trump or no Trump, the world is deglobalizing. And at least for a little while, will continue to do so. So China is going to have a real problem. Even before anyone was talking about coronavirus, even before anyone was talking about Donald Trump as president of the United States, Xi Jinping was pushing foreign companies out of China with his pro, um, you know, state enterprise economic system, you know, going back, throwback to what looked like the Maoist era. So American and other foreign companies were really starting to reconsider China and some were actually um, lessening their exposure to China. Then you get the so-called trade war, which is President Trump imposing the tariffs under Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974 as a remedy for which about the theft of U.S. intellectual property. Then you have companies like Google, GoPro, uh, Nintendo, RH, Restoration Hardware, um, even Apple were starting to take factories out of China. And now you've got coronavirus, you've got Xi Jinping on this, this xenophobic bent um, you know, you don't really need to have someone in the White House consciously saying, get the factories out of China. Those factories are going to be leaving anyway. And then one other factor, of course, since this is an economics podcast, um, or at least I think it is from the title it is. of it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so it's costs in China are just too high. Um, you know, even before all of this stuff started going on, Vietnam, Jordan, all these places were starting to get factories that were leaving China because of cost, environmental, and regulatory reasons. You put all that together, and you've got the makings of a deindustrialization of China. And it's going to be aided, I think, by political factors um, and by the revulsion of what um, Xi Jinping has been doing. So I think that um, it's not possible today. It sounds a little bit not feasible, but give it five weeks. Because as I said, five weeks ago, we weren't even talking about this stuff. Mr. Chang, it was a pleasure. It was an absolute honor for me to have you on this show. Uh, what's your Twitter handle so that we can find you on Twitter? It's Gordon G. Chang, G-O-R-D-O-N-G-C-H-A-N-G, at Gordon G. Chang. And I will put that in the description box below so that everybody can find you and get Gordon's book, The Coming Collapse of China. Thank you ever so much for being on our show today. Cornelius, it was an honor for me to be on your show. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good win and be safe. And healthy. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye-bye.